for the latest in the Yale Peabody Museum's series of graduate student research spotlight talks. Uh, my name is Mads O'Brien and I'm your moderator for today. Uh, so quickly before we get started, a couple housekeeping notes of how this event is going to go. At any point during the webinar, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post a question for our speaker. Um, we'll start answering those questions in the second half of the program, but you can submit one as soon as it pops into your head and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so I am so excited to welcome our presenter today, Duncan Keller. Uh, Duncan is in the final year of his PhD at Yale's Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. Uh, his research focuses on metamorphic rocks and minerals and on what we can learn about large scale processes like mountain building from looking at minerals under a microscope. Uh, Duncan has volunteered with the Peabody on and off since 2016, including uh, authoring some of the content for a mobile app that visitors can use in David Friend Hall uh, at the museum's gem and mineral gallery. It's free to download. Um, so Duncan, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mads, very much for that introduction. Um, so yes, my name is Duncan Keller. I'm a sixth year PhD student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, my advisor is Jay Agu, who's also a, a curator for the Peabody. And I'm really excited to be here today talking to you about the Appalachian Mountains and the work that our lab has been doing to help unravel their origins. So the Appalachians uh, stretch from Alabama all the way up into Canada, and they form most of the topography of the eastern United States. So I'm showing here a topographic map of the eastern US, uh, and I've just outlined in red the rough extent of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and something that I find truly fascinating about the Appalachians is that they've been around long before the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit more detail about that in a few slides. Um, but because they're so old, they're almost 500 million years old. In some places, like in the regions of Connecticut that I'm gonna be talking about today, instead of very tall mountains, like you would expect in the Alps or the Himalayas, there's only hills left. And this is because there's been hundreds of millions of years of erosion that has affected these mountains. Um, but the Appalachians, really did form over the course of hundreds of millions of years by plate tectonic processes. Now, when I say plate tectonics, what do I mean? So this is a term that um, some of you may have heard before. Plate tectonics is a scientific theory that explains the movements of the Earth's crust. So the Earth has layers. The outermost layer is the crust, which is uh, both continental crust and ocean crust. Underneath the crust is the mantle, and then the center of the earth is the core. But the crust is mostly rigid, um, and it's fairly brittle, and it's split into what we call tectonic plates. And underneath the crust, the mantle is flowing uh, pretty slowly at the rate about at which your fingernails grow. And it's flowing because it's heated from below by the cooling of the core. And so as the mantle moves, it pulls these tectonic plates at the, at the top of the Earth along with it, and they collide with each other. And when that happens, something has to give. Uh, and, and what happens is a process that we call subduction, where one of the plates sinks underneath the other. So here's a cartoon that just roughly illustrates that. And what happens during subduction is that the colder plate, generally that's the older plate, sinks underneath of the other one. Um, so here we've got uh, the upper plate, which has some continental crust on the right side here, and it's associated mantle beneath it. And then on the left is another plate that has some ocean crust, uh, and that ocean crust and mantle are subducting underneath the upper plate, which is on the right-hand side of this cartoon. Um, and then on the other side of that ocean basin, there is another continent that's coming along that will eventually collide with a continent on the right-hand side. So during subduction, the overriding plate here on the right is pushed upwards um, 
the ocean crust that's being subducted dehydrates and loses its water, which enters the overlying mantle and that creates melting. That magma ultimately makes its way to the surface uh, and erupts out of volcanoes like we see today in the Cascades of the United States uh, and Japan. The incoming continent will eventually collide once this ocean basin closes and it will crumple up uh, and form a very tall mountain range with the other continent. And we see examples of that in progress today in, uh, for example, the Himalayas. So when I talk about these colliding pieces of continent, what do I mean? Um, there are several size ranges, as you could imagine. Um, in the modern day Earth, uh, a full-sized continent colliding with another looks like India colliding with Asia or Africa colliding with Europe to form the Alps. Um, you can also have a microcontinent or just a smaller piece of continental crust colliding. For example, uh, if Madagascar were to crash into Africa, that would be a microcontinent continent collision. Um, or you could have what we call an island arc, which uh, is something like the Philippines, which I'm, I'm showing here, uh, or Japan, which is where there's a subduction zone underneath some crust and there's a long chain of volcanic islands. Um, that, if it collided with a continent, would also produce uh, some mountains. So just to reiterate these concepts quickly before we move into the, uh, the meat of the talk, when I talk about subduction and mountain building, what I'm talking about is ocean basins closing, which pushes continents up, the dehydration of the downgoing ocean basin melts the mantle, which makes volcanoes, and then finally, these two continental masses collide and make a very tall and wide mountain belt like today's Himalayas. So this is how um, Earth's largest mountain belts form. So we'll return here to the Appalachians. And now when I tell you that the Appalachians formed from repeated episodes of subduction and collision of different terrains like microcontinents and island arcs with what would become the eventual eastern coast of North America, you can envision what I'm talking about. And this process was happening between about 500 million years ago and about 250 million years ago. And there were a number of these collisions that took place, uh, probably about four to five of them. And the final one was the, the collision of Africa with North America, which formed part of Pangaea. And one of the ways that we know all this is from the geologic studies of the rocks that are now at the surface. So here I've overlaid on this topographic map a, a general geologic map of the different terrains of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and when we talk about terrains, we're just talking about the rocks that are associated with each of these different events. Um, and they're color coded here. But what I want to draw your attention to is how they kind of line up almost like a barcode. And you can see that, that this is evidence in terms of what types of rocks we see at the surface of these different episodes of mountain building and the accretion of these different microcontinents and island arcs to what would become North America. So in terms of the science that I'm gonna tell you about in this talk that we've been doing at Yale, our field area is in Connecticut. It's in the northeastern corner of the state, and I'm showing it in a black box here on the right, up in Tolland County. And these rocks are part of what is known as the central main terrain, uh, which I'm showing here on a geologic map on the left. And this is just a belt of rocks uh, that's from one of these mountain building events that formed the Appalachians. It stretches all the way from northern Connecticut all the way up into Canada. Um, and the central main terrain formed between about 420 million years ago to about 360 million years ago. And we call this part of the Appalachian mountain building the Akkadian and the Neo-Akkadian events. Um, and although this part of the Appalachians is essentially just hills now, we had known for a really long time that these rocks uh, in this region really represented the deep roots of ancient mountains. And that's from studies that had been done in the 20th century uh, that laid the foundations for all the work that I'm going to talk about today. 
Uh, so I'm going to tell you about the new discoveries um, from the 2010s that pushed these ideas even further. So the first evidence that we had that the rocks from this part of Connecticut were really extraordinary uh, came in 2012 and 2013 from some work that my advisor, uh, Professor Agu, did with some coworkers. And what they showed is that the minerals in these rocks, and therefore the rocks themselves, experienced what we call ultra high temperatures. And that means that the rocks reached during their metamorphism temperatures in excess of 900 and even in some cases 1000 degrees Celsius. And that's over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you think about how hot your oven is when it's at, you know, 400, maybe 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you multiply that by four, that's the kind of temperatures that we're talking about here. Um, and rocks that reach these sorts of conditions are really uncommon. Um, there's only maybe tens of localities worldwide that there are rocks that, that we know got this hot. So this is a pretty remarkable thing. And the way that we know that these rocks got so hot is from the chemistry of the minerals inside the rocks. Um, in this case, from these studies, the evidence came from three different minerals. The first is garnet, which is a beautiful red mineral that you've probably seen in jewelry. Um, the second is feldspar, which is a common mineral that makes up a lot of the Earth's crust. And the third is rutile, which is a titanium oxide mineral that's also fairly common in the crust. And the chemical analyses of all of these minerals in the rocks uh, gave us an indication of how hot the rocks had gotten. And it can also tell us about the pressure at which the minerals crystallized, uh, which tells us about the depth at which the rocks formed, which is something that I'll get to in a few slides as well. But what I'm showing here on the right is a microscope image in polarized light of the inside of a garnet crystal from one of these rocks. And you can see these beautiful little bright needles inside of the garnet. These are titanium oxide minerals that formed while the garnet was cooling. Um, this is a process that we call exsolution. That's the technical term for it. But it, what it really means is that the mineral was holding chemical components at very high temperature or pressure that it no longer could hold when it was colder. And so it expelled them and it formed these beautiful little needles. An analogy I like to use is if you've ever gone grocery shopping and you've come home and you wanna take your grocery bags inside and you, you pick up an armful of grocery bags and go to the door and you realize that you can't hold all of these grocery bags anymore and you have to set some of them down in order to open the door. This is sort of what these minerals experience where at high temperatures and pressures, they can take a bunch of extra, um, extra elements into their chemical structure. In this case, it's titanium. So the mineral sucks up a bunch of titanium when it's really hot. And then when it starts to cool down again, as it comes back to the surface of the earth, it can't hold that titanium anymore. And it spits it out and you get these beautiful little, little needles. Um, and these textures are, are really important because they indicate to us that the minerals experienced these very high temperature or high pressure conditions. So then in 2018, we found some more evidence of uh, these extreme conditions, this time from a different rock type, but from the same area. And in this case, what we found is that there are combinations of minerals in the rock that are diagnostic of a really deep and high pressure crystallization. So what I'm showing here on the right is a, uh, a photo of, of the rock itself, as you would see it holding it in your hand. There's a nice big red crystal of garnet here. There's a beautiful pink little crystal of corundum, which is the same mineral as ruby and sapphire. And then there's some crystallized feldspar melt that was around uh, when this rock was extremely hot. Now these rocks, uh, we calculated that they reach temperatures of 1,040 degrees Celsius, which is over 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit. We pushed that temperature estimate just a little bit more. And what's important about these combinations of minerals in the rock is that they tell us that the rocks crystallized at about 60 kilometers depth. So that tells us the thickness of the mountains, the thickness of the Earth's crust at which these rocks were at the bottom. And that helps us understand the actual height of the mountain belt 
and the seriousness of crustal thickening that happens uh, that happened during the collisions uh, that we're studying. And so that helps us understand what effects colliding bodies of different sizes, like a microcontinent or an island arc, can produce during mountain building in contrast to uh, something like two full-size continents colliding. And then um, in just last year in 2020, we published a paper about these beautiful textures that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here. These, uh, like the textures that I showed on the first slide, are inside of a garnet. And you can see that they're very similar to your eye. Um, these are in uh, this rock, which I'm showing on the left. You can see the beautiful pinkish red garnet crystals all sprinkled throughout it. And these are also X solution textures. These are also indicative that the garnet was holding a lot of extra um, elements at very extreme conditions and later had to release them. But what's special about these particular textures is the combination of minerals here inside of the garnet. Um, and there's a lot of technical details here, but uh, the fact that there are a variety of minerals that the garnet uh, expelled that formed needles here, including uh, quartz and also these other titanium minerals, tells us about the depths that the garnet reached before it had to come back up and, and release these chemical components. And what we calculated was that these textures indicate that the rocks made it to nearly 200 kilometers depth. And that is about 23 times the height from sea level to the top of Mount Everest. So these rocks were subducted very, very deeply. And then they came back up to the base of the crust. And then over hundreds of millions of years, the crust was eroded and they're now exposed at the surface. And we know that these rocks were originally mud on the ocean floor based on the chemistry of the entire rock itself. And, and what this discovery tells us is that some of the rocks in this part of the Appalachians were subducted very deeply and they took this very long journey all the way down and then all the way back up just to get to the base of the mountain where then eventually the, uh, the roots of the mountain would be exposed hundreds of millions of years later by erosion. And like the ultra high temperature rocks, um, these kinds of rocks, which we call ultra high pressure rocks, are only known from tens of places around the world. They're quite uncommon. And it's really exciting to see them here in the United States uh, and here in the Appalachians, where we know we had smaller pieces of crust colliding with a larger continent rather than two really large continents colliding. And just to show schematically on that cartoon that I had shown before, the journey that these rocks would have taken, they would have started on the ocean floor, been subducted, all the way down to their maximum depth, and then they would have come back up to the base of the crust here, where they're there with all the magmas and the really, the really hot rocks and all of this intense action that's going on. And then over the course of hundreds of millions of years, those rocks from the roots of the mountain all made their way back up to the surface where they had been exposed by erosion, and we can pick them up today. Um, and I'll just talk about one final discovery, which is another paper from our lab group this year, or sorry, last year in 2020, um, where uh, the authors found these crystallized remains of magma chambers from our field locality. And they're pointed out here in arrows uh, on the photo on the right. And what this indicates is that there were big magma chambers down there uh, at the base of the crust while all of this mountain building was going on. And in fact, these magmas are a really exciting thing to see evidence of because they might explain why the rocks down there were so hot. Um, and seeing these crystallized magma chambers tells us that there was probably volcanic evidence at the surface at the time, which um, like this classic photo of Mount St. Helens from the Western US here, um, lets us know that uh, we should expect to see the sorts of processes from this subduction that we see occurring in the modern day in lots of places around the world, uh, like the Cascades, like the Andes, and like Japan. So to summarize, um, our lab group in the last 10 years, various combinations of 
graduate students and professors and authors have, uh, have shown that the rocks that make up part of Connecticut's section of the Appalachians were both a lot deeper and a lot hotter than the other examples uh, from these mountains, than pretty much the rest of the rocks from the United States in these kinds of mountain belt settings. And they're comparable to just a small handful of examples known from around the world uh, of these really extreme kind of rocks. We found evidence of crystallized magma chambers that tell us about the volcanic activity that was going on during subduction and mountain building. And probably most importantly, they help us understand what effects these sorts of microcontinent and island arc collisions can produce, the severity of process and of metamorphism that we would expect to see from these kind of events uh, even hundreds of millions of years ago. And that's something that's a topic of, of ongoing research in the geologic community. And it's really exciting to have a really, really good example just here in our backyard of all of these different kinds of extreme rocks. So we hope that in the coming years, um, we'll, we'll discover even more wonderful things about, about these mountains. Um, and also that we expect that other parts of the Appalachians will reveal similar secrets uh, that, that will show us a lot about their history. Thank you. All right, great. Duncan, thank you so much. Um, so we already have, uh, you can choose whether you want to keep your slides up um, in case you want to refer back to them for any particular questions. Um, we already have a bunch of questions from our audience. Um, and I'll start with uh, one question, which is, uh, how are you able to calculate how hot these rocks got with so much precision um, to within like 40 degrees Celsius or the numbers that you've used? Uh, is your ability to do that based on the amount of X solution or on the type of minerals that are exolved? Ah, so that's a really good question. Um, oftentimes for these calculations of pressure and temperature, we're using a combination of different methods. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the first work that I talked about with the ultra high temperature rocks, um, the temperature estimates there came from uh, the feldspars and uh, the garnet and the rutile, um, but it was the feldspars that provided the sort of uh, a range of estimates and a range of ways to test um, that was complemented by the other methods. Um, some of these methods have seen more or less experimental study, um, and there's a lot of work that goes on to, to tighten up these calibrations. But in a lot of cases, you can get to within about 10 degrees Celsius uh, with, with a number of these methods. Um, and there are new ones that are continuing to be developed. One of the things that we hope is that, um, especially in Garnet with these uh, titanium, titanium X solutions, we, we could develop a uh, a really good calibration for temperature with that because one doesn't doesn't really exist yet. Um, so in this case, for this study, the X solution was uh, corroborating evidence, um, but didn't provide an exact uh, an exact mm -hmm. temperature. It was it was the chemistry of the titanium minerals that had exolved that uh, that gave us that number. Um, so it's a it's a variety of methods. Right. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is, um, you know, the area that you studied, you found these rocks, and as you said, in only tens of other places have rocks been found that have traveled this deep. Um, do you believe that uh, the area that you studied is rare because simply these types of studies haven't been conducted elsewhere in the Appalachians, or do you expect that this area is very special and very unique for the continental United States? Well, that's, that's an interesting question because there, um, there are multiple things intersecting there. Uh, you know, at a baseline, you can only find what's there. So mm -hmm. there are going to be certain places on Earth where the right rocks that got to the right conditions were exposed in the right place and the rock is actually there at the surface and it's not just, you know, some trees. Um, and in other cases, 
you know, geology is a science that has been going on for hundreds of years. And there are things that people looked at 50 years ago that weren't known to be indicative of a certain process that now we have a different understanding of. And so it's a combination of being in the right place at the right time and also uh, using the most modern methods to interpret the things that we see and having, you know, pretty high tech instrumentation to be able to uh, look at smaller and smaller scales and higher and higher resolution and capture images and do analysis of things that 20, 30, 40 years ago just weren't possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, so one question is about uh, something that you shared right at the very end, uh, the magma chambers that you showed. Um, and we have a question from someone asking about the locality of those and whether they're on public land. And is that something that someone could go and see for themselves? So these are not on public land, no, unfortunately. Um, but uh, there are um, examples of similar kinds of geology that exist in New York State. Um, there are some rocks right at the surface that were cooked by magmas and got uh, actually up to these, these ultra high temperatures. Um, that's called the Cortland complex in, in New York State. Um, so although you, you can't go and visit this site in Connecticut specifically because it's, it's not on public land, um, there are comparable examples that you could find in say a roadside geology field guide that you could, could buy in a bookstore. Nice, awesome, thank you. Um, so we have another question about uh, is the depth of a rock always correlated is well rather is depth always correlated with temperature beneath the surface do rocks exposed to uh, a greater depth or brought down to a greater depth are they always experiencing higher temperatures than ones that are shallower if that makes sense that's a really good question and the answer is that in Absence of other factors, yes, deeper is hotter. But if there was, for instance, a very hot magma, like a basaltic magma that was right up at the surface, like say in Hawaii, you know, these lava lakes, um, like at Kilauea, these big volcanoes, those rocks are really, 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 really hot and they're right there at the surface. So um, because the study of Earth science is the study of the intersection of many processes. Um, you can't just assume that the deeper rock is always hotter, no. Mm -hmm. um, so then we have another question about methodology and maybe this is methodology that you didn't use in this exact project. Um, but while your rock samples were collected right at the surface, how does one study rocks that are still buried? What methods exist to do that? Ah, well, um, there, are, there are many because uh, scientists have been very clever at working out ways to do that. Um, if you wanna look, you know, a few hundred meters down, you can drill down in most cases. Um, that's something that's used a lot for uh, exploration for oil and for, um, you know, metals and, and these sorts of natural resources. Um, a technique that sees a lot of use to study essentially any depth is called seismology, and that's using the, uh, the disturbances caused by earthquakes, in some cases even generated by human activity, to look at the structure of the Earth's crust, and even uh, as far down as the mantle and the core. So these, these earthquake waves will travel through the entire Earth and make it back to the surface, and we can uh, we can use those signals to look at the structures even thousands of kilometers deep. And there are, there are several faculty at Yale who do that. Cool. Um, so uh, another question, going back to specifically what this project was about. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that the rocks uh, that you studied descended about 200 kilometers or so, and then rose back up towards the surface. And we have someone asking, wouldn't those rocks have lost their original identity when they turned into a melted pool of elements in magma form? How would they retain that signature of their origin after it was melted? Ah, so not all of these rocks melted very much at all. 
Um, the example that I showed here, uh, where there's some crystallized melt around this garnet crystal, um, these rocks melted a decent amount. Um, but the rocks that traveled down about 200 kilometers only probably melted a bit. Um, it's hard to say exactly how much they had melted for sure, um, but we know that these garnets didn't melt and they constitute uh, a decent amount of the rock, probably 20, 30, 40% here. Um, you can see these, these bands, these light colored bands, those are feldspar and quartz, and those probably were molten uh, when the rock was at great depth. Um, but one of the really cool and useful things about these exolution textures is that they require that the rock has changed. They are evidence of change. And you don't need to have the thing preserved that was exactly there at 200 kilometers depth, as long as you can put it back together, right? So when you get a puzzle, uh, you know, a jigsaw puzzle, it comes in a bunch of pieces, but you put it back together, you get the same picture. So that's sort of what we did here. Chemically, we were able to analyze all of these little needles and analyze the crystal structure of the needles and understand um, the ways in which it was okay to put them back together chemically. And then we got what the garnet crystal would have been at 200 kilometers. And that was the evidence of these processes. And so in some cases, you can get the preservation, the direct preservation of rocks that came back from these extreme depths, their original minerals and textures, but you can also use these, uh, these special exolution textures to, to demonstrate evidence of that kind of process. Great, thank you. Um, so we've had a couple questions um, comparing the sort of uh, formations that you are studying to the kind of rocks that you might see in New Haven, uh, East, East Rock, West Rock, and um, Trap Rock ridges in the Connecticut Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so could you say a little bit about how the rocks that you were studying differ from what we see in East, Walk, East Rock and West Rock in the center? Sure. Of so East Rock and West Rock um, and the rocks like them that exist in South Central Connecticut are actually the result of the breakup of Pangaea. So this was, you know, a hundred million years after the end of the Appalachian mountain building processes. Um, when Pangaea was splitting up, there was a, an ocean, little arm of an ocean basin that almost opened up through Connecticut. It didn't quite, we'd call that a failed rift. Um, and the sort of reddish sandstones that you'll see around, some of the Yale buildings are built from them. You can see them as you're driving north on the highway out of New Haven. Um, those sandstones were deposited in that sort of proto almost ocean basin that started to form at that time. But East Rock and West Rock are the magmas, the crystallized remains of the magmas that were coming up um, as the crust was thinning and trying to break up there in, uh, in that sort of failed rift. So those, those rocks are significantly younger than the, um, the Appalachian Mountains, and they represent almost the reverse process to the sort of things that I'm, I'm talking about today. Wonderful. Um, let's see, um, scrolling through what we've got. Fantastic questions, everyone who is submitting things, by the way. Um, so hopefully this has a pretty short answer, but um, just for sake of comparison, uh, what are like the temperatures of molten lava that we might find at the surface compared to the maximum temperatures that what you studied has experienced? Mm -hmm. So um, basaltic lavas can be as hot as about 1200 degrees Celsius, maybe up to 1300. Um, it shouldn't be, be higher than 1300, but they, when they come out, they tend to be about 12 to 1100 Celsius. Um, so a bit hotter, um, but those rocks are fully molten. You know, that's, that's like a lava that's coming out of Kilauea in Hawaii. Um, once you get to uh, different compositions of magma that have essentially more quartz in them, those temperatures get a lot cooler. 
Um, this is the sort of magma that um, instead of crystallizing at depth and forming a granite might come out of a volcano like um, Mount Etna uh, in Italy. Um, those, those magmas can get, and lavas can get all the way down to you know, 900, 800 degrees Celsius. So they can be colder um, than the rocks that we're talking about here. Great, thank you. It's a helpful comparison. Um, so we have a viewer that commented on uh, the photos of the garnets in your rock sample, uh, saying that they looked fractured and kind of crunchy. Um, how the garnets that we see in jewelry, how do you get the jewelry to look like that? And so you're, you know, as opposed to these fractured and crunchy garnets. Mm. So you're, you're talking about, um, about this photo here where you can, you can see the fractures in the garnet. Um, I, I believe so, and maybe in the one with the hand sample as well. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer is that almost all of the garnet jewelry you see, those crystals aren't coming from metamorphic rocks, they're coming from igneous rocks, um, where you have the garnet crystallizing from a magma in a much less uh, disturbed mm -hmm. scenario. You know, these garnets have really been through so much. They've been heated and, and pressurized and, and sheared and crunched up. And it, it would be quite uncommon to see a garnet from this kind of rock that was really suitable for jewelry. Um, they also have, as, as I showed you, all of this stuff inside of them. They're full of little inclusions of other minerals and, and crystallized, you know, junk. Um, so to speak. That's not a very kind way to, to treat the garnet. Uh, I'm sorry, but, um, but it is true and it makes them less, uh, less desirable for jewelry when they look that way. Hmm. Um, so if you can stay on that slide for a moment, um, we have a question about the, the regular alignment and pattern of these mm -hmm. titanium oxide needles. Um, and that's quite different from, as you can see in the picture, other kinds of inclusions that are a lot more irregular. Um, so what causes that regular alignment of those needles compared to other things? So um, just, just uh, as I start this answer, the needles in this photo, um, there are titanium oxide needles here, but uh, a lot of what you're seeing here is actually quartz um, in this particular photo and, and some other minerals as well. Um, and that's what what's makes this example distinct from the the just titanium oxide example that I talked about um, on one of the earlier slides. Um, but the reason you see that alignment is because during an X solution process, it is, it's really a single garnet crystal that has this stuff in it, transforming into a garnet crystal plus all of these little needles. And these needles are each individual crystals and they each have their own crystal lattice. And they, as they form, have to conform to the structure of the garnet that is surrounding them. And so the reason you see this really beautiful pattern is that you're actually seeing the, the structure of the garnet expressing itself. Um, the, the directions that you see, there's one sort of north-south in the photo, and then there's one kind of uh, northwest to southeast and northeast to southwest. Those are actual crystal axes of the garnet's atomic structure that are regulating where these needles can form. Very cool. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite parts about this whole phenomenon and these textures is just how beautiful and geometric they are. Mm. And yeah, and just creating wonderful art. I noticed that this photo is also your Zoom avatar. Yeah. So, great picture. Um, so, ooh, let's see. Uh, we have a question about, might sound like a general question, but feel free to go as in-depth as you want to or not. We are coming up on 441. Um, there's a question about uh, just how do you, calculate the depth at which a rock is formed. Um, you know, what are the other, other than looking at the mineral under a microscope, what are sort of the other steps 
that allow you that help you get to that 200 kilometer depth number? Yeah, so um, I'll just put up a, I had a slide that covered most of, of what I used to get the data for this talk and the methods that the other authors had used from our lab group. Um, the number that we would quote you for a temperature or a pressure um, comes from the chemical analysis from a machine that's called an electron microprobe. And that uses an electron beam to measure very precisely the concentrations of the different elements in the sample. So if you have a garnet and you wanna know how much silicon and aluminum and titanium and iron and magnesium and so on and so forth is in that, it's that chemistry of the mineral that you then use with different sets of equations to calculate the temperature or pressure. And what you really need there is analyses of two different minerals that were talking to each other chemically, were exchanging atoms, and different sets of minerals will form different equilibration uh, arrangements in terms of chemistry at different conditions. So a really common one is to use garnet and mica, um, and garnets and micas will talk to each other and exchange um, usually it's iron and magnesium that's used. Um, but if you have a garnet and a mica that are touching each other in a sample and you can uh, plausibly you know, ascertain that, that they were talking to each other efficiently, they were hot enough that they could exchange atoms reliably, um, you can measure their compositions and then calculate a temperature uh, from that. Thanks, very interesting. Um, so I, let's go with, two more questions perhaps. Um, so one we have is, uh, so I'll, I'll just read you this one verbatim, um, is the implication of the scholarship that you've talked about today that island arc collisions produce higher temperatures than continental collisions? Um, and if that is the case, if that's the implication, why do we think that is? Uh, that is not a statement that I would agree with. Um, something that's important to note is that, and this is a, a detail that I, I sort of glossed over, but when you have the subduction of ocean crust, that's dehydrating and you're getting melting of the mantle, probably melting of the lower crust, and you're getting all these magmas. Once this second continent arrives, you're not putting ocean crust down that subduction zone anymore. And so there should be a reduction or maybe even a cessation of that magnetism. Mm -hmm. So you're getting thicker crust from two continents colliding and you're getting more magma generation from the ocean crust being subducted. So there's a whole series of processes that happen over the evolution of the life of a subduction zone. And you're gonna get different uh, kinds of rocks forming at different points. So you wouldn't expect to see rocks uh, like this middle example that I talked about that formed at the base of the crust at significant depth, but also very hot, unless that continent and the microcontinent or island arc had already collided and you had that very thick, tall mountain belt. You just can't get this kind of metamorphism without that collision. But you can get temperatures that are really hot before that collision if, for example, there is a bunch of magma down there that's bringing heat up. So these processes are really complex. And in some cases, it can be hard to unravel um, the temporal details of exactly what happened when. Um, but that's an area of, of ongoing research. And that's something that it's, it's really exciting to pull apart. Yeah. Um, so my final question for you uh, as we wrap up, and thank you again, Dun Duncan, for your presentation. Um, so we have a question that I think everyone will be interested in. Um, are there any geology focused walks for interested members of the public uh, in the area of New Haven or elsewhere in Connecticut that you would personally recommend or cool features near where we live uh, that you would recommend checking out? Um, well, I know East Rock and West Rock came up uh, in the questions and answers, and I, um, I really enjoy walking up those. Uh, 
um, and, and just looking at them, I think they're really pretty. Um, I know that uh, Sleeping Giant State Park is a nice place to hike. Um, everybody's obviously looking for, you know, appropriate, uh, safe and fun outdoor activities at this time. So I, I can certainly recommend visiting those three just in the local New Haven area. Um, it can be hard in the Northeastern US to find good rock outcroppings. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I'd recommend um, going on the internet and Googling. Um, there are a bunch of articles. There are also books, these, these field guides um, of states and, and regions that will tell you about different places you can go and hike, even some places you can go and collect minerals. Um, there, there are places where it's safe and appropriate to do that as well. Um, so I, I can't endorse any one particular, you know, book or website or something, but uh, that information is widely available um, and very useful. And I would encourage all of you to, uh, to go and, um, yeah, look for some, uh, some pretty hikes and, and see some cool rocks and get out there and, and enjoy it. Great, thank you. Um, thanks again, Duncan, for your time this afternoon. Uh, thank you to also some of the Peabody staff behind the scenes helping with this webinar, uh, David Heiser, Sydney Munchnik, uh, Chris Renton, and to our wonderful cat closed captioner. We appreciate your work very much. Um, and thank you to our audience for our, your insightful questions. If you enjoyed this webinar, I would encourage you to sign up for the museum's mailing list to be notified about future events like this one. Um, our next research spotlight talk is actually on February 4th. Um, so you can find more information about that very shortly on the Peabody's website and social media. Uh, with that, uh, have a good night and stay healthy, everyone. <laughs>